What's going on, y'all? I'm Bud Elliott. That's Cooper Patagna. And we are back on the college football lunch break here on the Cover 3 YouTube channel. Really appreciate everybody tuning in today. And this is kind of the this is kind of the, the, the nerd spot, right? I mean, th this is where we really get in the nitty gritty. If you just love the intricacies of college football, um, this is your spot. If you're on the West Coast, maybe you're enjoying a cup of coffee. Uh, Cooper, you're, you're central time zone, right? So I'm central in Birmingham, yep. Yeah, so we, we kind of do this East Coast time zone, uh, but 24-7 is really a, a central time zone company. So we'll, I guess we'll move this around somewhat. Um, let's see if we get a couple couple commenters in here, get a couple live viewers going, and it should be should be a fun day. Uh, Coop and I have just been kicking around a couple things on the group chat to figure out uh, what to talk about today. And there's a lot of stuff going on, not a lot of games being played, but a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And Cooper having you know, worked in college football personnel for – you know, for what, about a decade, right? Or, or, or close to it? No, not, not a decade. I mean, seven years, I think. We can round up. I mean, I, yeah. I, I went to public school, but let's, let's, yeah. let's, let's round that thing up. <laughs> um, you know, is, is a great guy to talk to on this. Obviously, you know, he knows what, what kind of going on in the industry. And I, I kind of nerd out on the trends and kind of how the industry is, is all changing. So um, one thing I wanted to just, let's just kick this right off the bat. Coop said, hey, did you see the clip uh, of Kirby Smart after the national title game? And, and I figured it was going to be him saying, like Nick Saban typically is like, oh, man, everybody's got a head start on on me on recruiting. You know, I've had a coach in this national title game, and and they've been recruiting for seven days. And everybody's like, okay, Nick. But I, I thought this was interesting from, from Kirby. So I'm going to go ahead and play this, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what the audience thinks about this. It worries me, I'll be real honest with you, where the game of college football is going. First concern I have, the best leaders and the best men to run it and be organized with it are leaving. Because you said relentless. They're, the best coaches are going to the NFL because they get more time with their families. They want no part of NIL, portal, constant recruiting. And you say, well, why not? Go live it and see how long you want to do it. It's not what it used to be. And I see coaches left and right, you know a lot of them, that have stepped out of this game that are saying, I'm done. Good men, great leaders, they don't want to be a part of it. That concerns me for the future of it. Where's it going? I, all right, so what, what uh, just off the jump, Kirby is worried that your best people in college football are leaving, presumably trying to go to the NFL. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel it um, in, a, in a, I guess, in a sense, I kind of lived it, too. And I know I'm not the only individual that feels that way. And I think it means a lot to have somebody like Kirby Smart, head coach of a, a national championship team and uh, obviously an organization that's that's doing it at as high of a level as George is doing it. So it, that means something, I think, not only coaches, uh, but under the surface as well, support staff. I think they're starting to feel this strain. And I think. It's pretty interesting, you know, like listening to, to Mark Emmert kind of uh, address uh, um, in his speech a few weeks ago, talking about how the NCAA, he compared it to uh, his love of sailing and, and talked about how they're not built to make these um, significant changes and turns uh, as quickly as the game is now uh, rapidly expanding and, and uh, turning over. So. I think there's there's uh, what you're seeing here. You're seeing a residual effect uh, of a little bit of burnout uh, from not only these coaching staffs, but support staffs and, and administrations, everybody involved, uh, trying to comprehend and understand the changes and the changes that need to be made uh, coming down from the transfer portal to, to NIL. Um, and it's a lot of stuff happening, and I'm not sure uh, that most programs around the country really had a plan for it. No, I, I think you're right there. There, there's certainly a, uh, in in many ways, a more difficult job than it used to be, right? You have transfer portal now, which is a really a, a 24 seven thing. I mean, I was at the convention and I had coaches saying, "Hey, look, I have to go back to campus to make sure this running back doesn't transfer and go see him in person, and 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 try to get a private flight home after seeing an in home with another running back that I was visiting on the recruiting trail right right before." you know, the, the early signing period. So I, I understand a lot of these gripes, obviously. Um, I I kind of have some questions, though, and I, I, we, we may end up arguing about this, which 
hey, that makes for good content. One of the things that I would assert here is that almost all of these problems are a result of trying to keep a system which doesn't pay the labor, right? If you think about this, there is no transfer portal in the NFL or in Major League Baseball or the NBA or hockey or really any other sport that brings in billions of dollars like college football does via the TV contracts and, and all the other contracts they have. You know, a lot of these complications are just born out of the, the mental and, and legislative gymnastics that are required to keep the system in place for not paying guys. And the reason you don't have this in the pros is because guys are under contract. You can't portal from the Steelers to the Bengals because we know how long you're going to be there. But if they weren't paid, uh, like officially, you know, with actual contracts, with, with contractual language, the NFL guys would be, would be dealing with this as well. And it, to me, I'm not saying that we need to pay these guys a, a salary, but th this is a clear result of not doing so, right? Because you can't, but obviously a lot of these coaches want to have a transfer portal window, which all, all of them want it. A lot of them realize it's unlikely to pass because it's going to be seen as a restriction on the student athlete, right? Like that's what their compliance people and, and what their attorneys are, are likely going to tell them. Um, you know, I so I, on that on that kind of thing, it's like okay, we can bitch and moan about this as, as coaches and certainly as as back office personnel guys, but you realize you make the money you do because of the situation that has led to the portal and to NIL. In no other sport that brings in billions of dollars, do we have assistant coaches making more than good players on teams. Hell, like it, it, in the NBA or baseball or NFL, do, or do any do any head coaches make more than some of the better players on the team? I, I kind of doubt it. So the reason these salaries are so inflated, or I don't even want to use the word inflated. The reason these salaries are what they are for everybody, top down, and it's certainly it's more top than down because you got a lot, a lot of guys, you know, working for, for 50K or 75K, um, is because you don't have to pay the labor. If you wanted the transfer portal to go away and you want – NIL to become more ingrained and, you know, and, and do it through the program, put the guys on contracts, but you won't make as much money. I mean, Kirby Smart still may make seven or eight million, but a lot of these guys that are making four or five, if they had to pay the players, would probably be going down to making like, you know, one. That's kind of my take on it. So it is a little catch 22. Be careful what you wish for, coaches. Yeah, no, I'm with you. You know, I think for me, I guess, in, in my lens, and I think you have a really good lens on it that is from a different perspective and, and something that I, I probably wouldn't have put as much time or thought uh, process into. I think, you know, what I think about is, is these administrations and these support staffs not being able or being equipped to handle the changes that are happening so rapidly. And I, I think that is where some of the frustration is coming from, especially with the calendar and the transfer portal. You talk about, you know, not only the, the, talent acquisition, the development phase, but now you add another layer in having to retain uh, the, the prospects that you've already signed to uh, a letter of intent, which is just a completely different element um, for these coaches to have to handle. So I think what you've seen in Alabama is always a really good program to look at. They're, they're usually the program um, that has a good sense and a really good feel of the way that the game is changing. And they're very progressive on, on how they build their staff out. But uh, these player development roles that they have uh, at Alabama, three, four uh, player development, full-time employees, those guys are there to make sure that they can keep the pulse on the team and the individuals on the team uh, and have that sort of understanding if a guy is leaning out or maybe has a situation at home uh, that is not conducive to him uh, to where – the coaches can come back into play and the decision makers can come back into play uh, and swing that player to be able to fulfill the rest of uh, his financial aid agreement out of the program that he initially signed with. So I think it's just that's a frustration. I think dollars and, and cents, uh, all the points that you raise are uh, very valid. Um, what I see is you're seeing a lot of stress, not only on the 11 full time coaches, um, and the head coach, and, and you make a good point, right? Kirby Smart's out there uh, 
you know, making eight million dollars. But I do think it's significant that he is the one that raises this as an issue or this is something that's not going to be talked about. I think it's the people under, like I said, in, in these support staff roles uh, for programs that aren't at Florida with a seven and a half million dollar uh, salary pool for support staff for Alabama or Georgia that are starting to feel the weight of this, because not only are they supposed to do the one job that they're assigned to, there's two or three roles now that you really kind of have to overcompensate for. And and Coop, I think what a lot of these staffs are looking for, and there's a lot of ways we can take this and, and we'll take this over the next 45 or hour or so, is some certainty, right? If you're Kirby Smart, you'd like to know what this is going to look like in a couple of years so you can try to get ahead of it. I mean, B Bama is trying to get ahead of it and are doing a good job based on what we think is going to happen. But even Nick doesn't know exactly where, where this is all going to go. I and mean, we, we just had the NCAA Constitutional Convention vote, which, well, it doesn't guarantee that the Power Five will pull away. And, and I thought Matt Brown of Extra Points, who we had on the show uh, last week, made a good point that a lot of these Power Five schools are going to want a couple more schools to come along because you don't want to go 2-10 and 10 every year at South Carolina if all you, if you have a 40-team division. Right. Like somebody has to go two and ten at that point. Uh, but it is it seems increasingly likely that we will have a division that maybe wants to actually pay its guys, which could really change things going forward. Because right now, as you mentioned, a lot of these guys who just want to coach ball would like to go to the NFL. And I think probably your better ball coaches have the opportunity to do so. A lot of these guys, though, who are there as recruiters don't because the NFL, you don't have to recruit your guys. And if you're, if your job in college football is based on your relationships with guys or you know, making sure that, that the players still like you, so they don't want to transfer, you know, that that's not really a, a position that seems likely to be able to go to the NFL. But I, I thought this quote, and I want to bring this in from Bob Cunningham, the North Carolina athletic director, who's been there for a long time. Uh, he was like very anti NIL. It seemed even, I don't know, two years ago or something. And uh, now, quote, this is from Dennis Dodd's story uh, last week. Uh, quote, I do think we're probably two to three years away from having a different relationship with our student athletes, uh, said respected North Carolina AD Bubba Cunningham, who is entering his 27th year in athletics administration. Continuing, uh, it won't necessarily be the student at, at the university. It may be employee employer. Like if that, if we got the North Carolina athletic director saying that, this is kind of a whole new ball game going on. Right. And I, I don't know that we're going to get there as quickly as Bubba Cunningham thinks. But that vote last week, it, it really could change things. And for schools that are staffing up now to have NIL specialists and, as you mentioned, guys whose job basically is, is to make sure the players stay happy, that may not be quite as important if you have a defined contract. Right. Like, I'm sure we got guys working for us who are not the most happy, but they're not going anywhere for a little bit because they're on contract. Right. Yeah, and that's that's the the other part of this that I, I'd be interested to get your opinion on. But I mean, we talk about and I had no idea how true this is, but the stories flying around out there about Texas A&M having a twenty million dollar budget uh, for their two thousand twenty two class, which is I'm throwing the flag the on that. Best of of like, all time. You're throwing the flag on it. Yeah, I I yeah, just like as far as under the table stuff, right? You know, or the stuff that doesn't get reported. It would not shock me if like five star quarterbacks got a mill. Position players, though, twenty or thirty million. I, are, we I, I, are we talking about Texas A&M? Th 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 is this that is the what class I, we're talking about? Th their class is potentially going to be the best class of all time. I know, I, but what I'm saying is, if there's this no is way they spent board, twenty or thirty million on that class. I'd be I don't really... know how the I don't know how the numbers shake out. What I'm saying is, if I was playing a video game NCAA and I was putting a team together or a recruiting class, my class wouldn't look that much different than what Texas A&M put together this year. Oh, it's not. I mean, you, you look at it. Walter Nolan, number two player in the country. Gabriel Brownlow Dendy, top ten player in the country. This is just defensive line. Anthony Lucas, another top thirty two player in the country. Shamar Stewart, they're in the mix for. Harold Perkins just decommitted, but Chris Marshall, Evan Stewart, Connor Wigman, so on and so forth. Those are all guys within the top 32. Um, like I said, it's one of those classes that is very different in stature where maybe only Georgia and Alabama 
in this year's class uh, are comparatively relatively. So I guess my question is from a, from a broader standpoint, is NIL meant for the opportunities to be able to um, swindle players in the process of being able to, to decide where they're going to and enroll in a school? Or is it based off the opportunities that are provided once you sign? And I, I guess what I'm trying to understand, isn't that something that they're trying to they don't they don't basically want it to be free agency as these guys are, are trying to figure out where they're going to go play at the next level. But that's what it's become to some extent. Who can provide the best opportunities financially once you sign with that university? OK, so to me, the way NIL has gone all comes back to that one goal which is not having to pay the players out of the money you get out of your TV contracts and out of your ticket sales. If your boosters want to pay them on top, absolutely the schools are fine with that. Like they're going to say they're not, but they their entire goal, all of the weirdness of this sport comes back to that one thing, not having to pay the guys out of the money you take in from your TV contracts and your tickets. That's pretty much every single vote. You can look at it through that lens. You're, oh yeah, that makes sense why they voted that way. That makes sense why, why we didn't pass an actual NIL law and tried to punt it to Congress. And of course, Congress has bigger things to worry about, so they're not going to get it done. Do I think that they thought it was going to spiral uh, this quickly? Probably not. Um, but if anything, I, I think it's maybe allowed some more in different schools to compete, right? Maybe you had some boosters who were not willing to uh, play the traditional bagman game, right, at certain schools, uh, and who maybe now down the line or, or currently are more willing to do so via NIL. Um, you know, like I, I certainly AM has a great NIL program. I, I was just throwing the flag. I don't think that they spent 20 or 30 million. I think that was some nonsense from an Oklahoma message board that all of a sudden, for some reason, got aggregated on another site. And then that aggregated article got tweeted out. And I, I'm, I'm very, uh, I'm skeptical of that number. So let's say 20, let's say 20, would it make more sense if it was 20 million over the span of a four-year scholarship? Uh, I mean, certainly that is less egregious, I guess, but uh, it's, that would still seem somewhat high to me, right? Like no, knowing the deals that, that Bryce and those guys got and publicly talked about, uh, I just, I don't know how that, I don't know how that scales downward. It, like, if you're looking at that, that, that's almost implying that like the 20th guy in a number one rated recruiting class is getting, you know, mid six figures guaranteed per year. And I just don't know that that is likely. Right. I, 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 right. There's a lot of these guys. Like I know coaches who have told dudes before who have quote unquote street agents, you know, or just agents, right. At the high school level. Like I know a guy who's, who's told a kid, I was, I was next to him when he was on the phone. Hey, man, call me back when you don't have an agent anymore. You're not that good. And they signed that kid. You know, so not, not every kid gets a bag dropped on him. You know, now, if you sign the number one class, you probably have to be very committed to recruiting. And you also have, like, it's not just NIL, right? You also have to be very good at recruiting. Like, let, I don't want to besmirch the efforts of Texas a and that they're doing on the actual recruiting side. I mean, James Cole is a very good recruiter. So is Damian Craig. Obviously, Jimbo's a really good recruiter at the head coach position and emphasizes recruiting. I mean, they they spend a lot of money behind the scenes on personnel too. You know, to have an entire uh, an entire department. Which I'm interested in in hearing from you. Like, how do you think some of these recruiting and scouting departments are going to change going forward with you know, the implementation of the portal and with NIL and um, and just kind of what your general strategy of staffing would be there. Yeah, I think what you're going to see now is you're going to see kind of more of a, I guess, a lean towards an NFL style um, flowchart organizational structure. So I, I think they're, they'll break it down into two. They'll have the high school identification and evaluation process, uh, and then they'll have the collegiate um, part of the process as well, identifying uh, potential targets via the transfer portal um, to basically – uh, address needs uh, year in and year out. So I think that will all fall under the umbrella uh, of player personnel. I think both of those departments work uh, hand in hand 
with each other in terms of trying to find a balance. I know we wanted to talk about this, but there's some teams and some really interesting situations between Brian Kelly at LSU and Lincoln Riley at USC, you know, who are in the double digit range now of transfers that they're taking this year. And I know you had a statistic and are, are very um, convicted on the idea that that is more than likely the best way to go in terms of your first year transition and, and, and filling out your roster as opposed to signing uh, what's left over in the second signing period. Yeah, this is something I've been tracking. And you know, obviously, we get a little more data on this every year. Unfortunately, college ball data has been kind of weird in recent years because of super seniors and the uh, the, the COVID cap that was not in place for the 2021 roster year, but now is is reinstated of 85 uh, for you know 2022 and going forward. Um, but my initial research on this indicates that your washout rate, your attrition rate at the high school level, when you sign a class in the early signing period era, is is really, really bad. And it's been bad pretty much regardless of whether you went on to have success or whether you failed. So from that first, you know, that first year, right? From Willie Taggart to Dan Mullen to Jimbo Fisher, all had various levels of success, right? Taggart was ended up being terrible. Mullen made the SC title game. You know, Jimbo's had some nice years there at AM. They're all in that like upper 70s percent, right? Of of attrition by like year three. It's crazy to have three quarters of the guys you sign at the high school level washing out that fast. And and my my theory on this is that if you think about college football recruiting as a market, right? And so one of the market inputs is offers and who's pursuing a kid. My my general theory is that. If you end up signing a really good ranked class of high schoolers and you manage to do so in only two weeks, it's probably likely that some of those higher rated kids that you got were guys who we might have had misranked, right? We're not perfect. And they were available for a reason and probably for a bad reason, meaning, you know, mental health issues, competitive temperament, character, academics train wreck of a family, which unfortunately does impact some of these guys. And you, you know it, right? Like, you know, it, it ends up their entire family's moving up there with them to try and live in the player dorm and um, just guys who are not ready to, to live on their own uh, for whatever reason. I would go heavy, heavy, heavy portal, just in my opinion, I could be wrong on this and the data is limited. So I don't want to speak in absolutes, but I would go heavy portal, take limited high schoolers. And then imagine the playing time you could sell at the high school level in that first full class when you've actually had time to have junior days and summer camps and all, all the other stuff. Like, I don't know what you think of that. Obviously, it does kind of screw with your roster if you go really heavy portal, but the high school risks, I think, are potentially significant, man. Yeah, no, I think you're getting more bang for your buck with a known commodity, and I think that's really important. And I think, you know, if you're in a coaching transition, I think a lot of those pre-existing and prior relationships that you've had on the recruiting trail – um, are obviously really important um, depending on where you go next. But, I mean, you look at the job that LSU's done. Uh, they address two tackle spots, one guy from uh, FIU and Miles Frazier, another one from East Tennessee State, get a, a freshman all-conference SEC defensive lineman from, from Missouri. Um, and then you start to see the vision take place. They address some uh, depth issues at the receiver position. And, you know, it was – a little bit more reactionary on my end, but it, it starts to kind of make sense. You kind of understand where they're going. And then really the guys that you see on the trail for, for Brian Kelly, and I'm just using LSU as an example, but it's Jacoby Matthews from Louisiana and Ponchatoula. It's Harold Perkins, um, who's long had an infatuation from LSU, who's originally from New Orleans. You're almost better just going back to the basics. Uh, in, in terms of the recruiting process, addressing in-state needs, making sure you're taking care of your five, six-hour radius within 300 miles, not overextending yourself and putting a Band-Aid and trying to address some issues uh, that might be a little bit more long-term. Um, so I like certainly what they've done. I like what USC's done, Lincoln Riley's done uh, out at Southern Cal. And then there's, you know, there's, there's other programs too, like and just because you're successful doesn't mean you're not vulnerable to this attrition. I think that's what we're starting to find out as well. I mean, ask Kirby Smart about that. 
you know, loses Latavius Brini and then and, and uh, Jermaine Burton uh, to Alabama and Arkansas. So so two guys within the conference. And then you look at Arkansas and the job that they've done being able to go get Drew Sanders. Um, and I'm missing I'm missing another one, Brini uh, as well from Georgia. So and McLaughlin uh, from LSU as well. Right. But you you look at Arkansas and comparatively to an LSU or comparatively to a USC and you say, all right, how are these teams using the portal different? Now, I think LSU's hope is to get to where an Arkansas is, where they have a very established culture, uh, where they've leaned heavily on the ID and evaluation process, uh, and that their attrition rates might be lower than the market value. Then that gives them the luxury to be very selective uh, in the transfer portal process. And uh, it's kind of interesting seeing this this play out because obviously this is something that's very new. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, you, you mentioned kind of how the staffs are changing there with having a, basically a, a, a college side and, and then a high school evaluation side. It just makes sense that you devote your resources uh, roughly along those splits. I mean, probably not, not 50-50 uh, because there's there's less – there's a little bit less like you know long-term legwork that needs to be done on portal guys. Like you're not really going to be looking at portal guys two years out most likely. I mean you'll you'll have your scouting notes from when they were high schoolers, and you'll monitor them. But there, there's less like relationship building, official relationship building that needs to go on if you don't think the kid's going to hit the portal for for two years. Because legally, you're not allowed to contact him anyway. We all know how this works. You call the high school coach or the seven on coach. You're like, hey man, hope he's happy. Really loved him as a player, as a high schooler. If he's not working out there, um, you know, I, I think we would still be a, a great fit. You can't contact the kid, you know, ab- above board. Uh, what one comment I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, to bring in here was from Dominic, uh, and I think this is actually an interesting thing because with the portal and with these guys being able to go anywhere really at any time, it it kind of does seem that you may have fewer and fewer guys who are really, really old school, hardcore coaching. I don't really care if you take the way I coach you the wrong way. Cause I, I'm very confident in my method. The, the cool be your friend coach. I'm not saying that's actually better for the player, but it might be better for your, your program's player retention. Yeah. I mean, I get that. I, I think like, I don't know. Like, it, just to be frank, I think there's so much BS involved oh, yeah. in the changes that are happening in college football. And people behind the scenes are kind of like, what in the hell is going on? All these bullets are flying. The, the rules are changing rapidly. There's no regulations. Uh, it's the wild, wild west behind the curtains. Um, and that's the part. And I do think it leaves an opportunity for this type of individual to succeed in this setting. Now, you can take that whatever way you want, but the, the purest, the college football coach that got into it because he wanted to teach, he wanted to develop. uh, And this was truly uh, something that that individual was passionate about. Yeah. There's going to be more of a want to, to go work in the NFL where you don't have to worry about this type of stuff. You don't have to put in over, uh, uh, you know, um, 18 months to 24 months of work on one individual only to see that person hit the transfer portal, not even owe you an explanation, go to compliance, put his name in, and within 24, 48 hours is enrolling at a new institution. Um, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, and like you said, there's there's a balance between the compensation and what you're getting paid. But for the people who aren't getting paid $8 million a year, $4 million a year, seven, dollars $800,000, you name it, it's like, why am I doing this? And I think that's there, there's this crossroads that a lot of these individuals that got into this thinking that the game was something um, other than what it's turned out to be, there's a lot of frustration that's boiling over. And you're either finding guys that are talented enough to go work at the NFL level where it's just the game and they can focus on that aspect of their job, or they're going to say, I'm done with this. I'm going to go do something else. It's not worth my time. And I'm not being financially compensated for, for the work that I'm putting in. Um, to do what it takes to be successful in this day of age of college football. I, I think you're 100% right there, right? Like it, we can acknowledge that the reason why a lot of these positions get paid what what they do is because you're not having to pay, 
you know, the, the, the athletes that make the game. And that's really not a situation you have in inner sport. At the same time, though, for some of the folks who the money is not that great, if they got in it for non-monetary reasons and they have ability to go earn a living in another profession, I, I think increasingly they, they may go do that, right? If, if, if you're really good with data, go work in business, right? You don't have to work in recruiting data and, and make, I don't know, 70 or, or, or whatever at one of these schools. Go go make 190 and not have to that's 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 happening right now. Yes, exactly. You know, that 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 is not something that's going to happen. That's something that's been happening and is going to continue to happen. You're you're talking about the majority of people who are not making life changing money, if we want to call that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or above, are going to sit back every 12 months and reevaluate come February when they have that dead period and say, should I really be doing this or am I better off spending my time somewhere else? Yeah. I, I, I know a guy that man, that manages creative for an sec school. And he's like, dude, it's hard for us to keep people because our coaches are asking us to make graphics on Christmas. And like, you have to understand how different people work. And it's not like we're paying these graphics guys a hundred K right. They make like one, one is, is a student making you know, like the, the parts that paid student money. And the other one makes like 50 and right. like graphics guys and creatives are not motivated the same way uh, that coaches are. Cause they don't necessarily have the same level of incentives, but, but the workload has gone up a ton. And I like, that's something that I think you and I both hear from a lot of these guys that work in the game. Like they feel like they don't get a break at all. It would be interesting if you hit them with the question, they're like, Hey, would you rather have less work and then less money? if guys were locked in on contracts and you knew that there, there was some certainty there and you know you put the work in on the guy recruiting them and you're able to sign him to a contract coming out of high school uh, like college baseball coaches don't really worry as, about the guys going to the or going to the going to baseball draft until after year 3 right because they know the yeah. rule you either go pro or you come here the, there is a trade off though for for that certainty of, of roster stasis potentially yeah i think it's more uh, you know, the, the way I think about it when I start thinking about, you know, my experience in college football and a lot of people that I still talk to, it's more of like quality of life, yeah. you know, work life balance. And, and you talk about it, but football is a funny thing, especially at the collegiate level. You think about the NFL and how does it work between a front office and a head coach and ownership? There has to be alignment, but there's also a checks and balance system. It's not just the head coach. Uh, who has the executive power to make every decision in the building. There's also not executive overreach from the head coach to to get involved with what marketing may be doing, and what our plan is there. When you're a head coach of a college football team, you have the autonomy to make all those decisions. Think about how scary that is. I know a lot of good people that have gotten fired by football coaches that have no expertise to be involved in some of the things that they're involved in. And we talk about the creative process and creative designers who are, I mean, creative designers and football coaches couldn't be any further right. different individuals. They really couldn't. And then you have to put them under one roof. And, and, and then the football coach is who's trying to address his needs on the recruiting trail and has a board over a hundred prospects once are graphic for every prospect every day and has no understanding of what goes into the creative process or the time it takes to turn something like that around. Um, that is the frustration. I think that's a frustration with creative. I think that's a frustration with operations, recruiting, equipment. You go down the list, you have people um, by no means that should have any ability to have executive oversight over these departments, and they do. It all has to funnel up somewhere. I guess what I'm saying is, think about all the responsibilities of a head coach. Not only on the recruiting trail, we talk about talent acquisition, development uh, on and off the football field, player retention, not to mention um, meeting with the, the, the administration and the boosters and being able to keep all those people happy and then to manage a whole nother side of that for one person. It's a lot. And what happens is your boat ends up taking taking in too much water. And you can't do it. And, and I guess that's why I always come back to administrations being equipped for success, programs being equipped for success. There has to be a high level of 
um, awareness of what your program needs to succeed in terms of the bodies in the organization. Uh, and I think there has to be a high level of empowerment and trust. And not everybody, not every coach is a great CEO. It doesn't mean they're not a good football coach. Uh, but that lack of self-awareness has certainly found some coaches, Dan Bull and Jimmy Lake, to name a few, in situations where they're good football coaches. They have proven track records. They found themselves in situations where they're out at the end of the day because they don't understand that process and everything that goes into the game. It, exactly right. I, I think Patrick Ken, you know, did, is is good here. You know, comping this to other industries. Right. This is an interesting look at mid-tier professional burnout in college football terms. Um, one thing that I, I think it's also interesting when we talk about this level of money and this level of responsibility in the NFL, Mike Tomlin is not managing the graphics department and he's not managing the personnel department. He can give the personnel department feedback on the guy, the type of player that he feels his roster needs based on how he wants to coach the team. But it, it's really a unique responsibility and increasingly being a good head coach, I think is probably less important about being good at coaching football. It's really more about because you don't really have other people running this stuff. I mean, it, having a strong AD can help, but tell me a job where you know, the, the the subordinate makes 8x what what what, what the uh, the boss makes, and I'll, I'll show you a job where the power structure is not really the power structure, which is what we have in right. college football. Uh, so having somebody who is a good, I think CEO behind the scenes is really really probably more important than it's ever been considering all of the important stuff that we have off field in this crazy sport that we both love. I mean, certainly more than you used to. Yeah. There's a balance of it, right? Like in a, I knew we we're going to get into this, but like Billy Napier, you see what he's done. And, and I've said this, like Florida and Billy Napier are rewriting the blueprint for what it looks like to be a national championship staff off the field. And, and that's what I mean, strictly off the field and what he's building uh, and the number of jobs that uh, he's creating at the University of Florida. Um, that does not matter if that doesn't directly affect the product on the field. And I think that's important to keep in mind. It's like, you know, when I was at Washington, Chris Peterson was the best CEO that I'd have ever been around. I don't think I'll be around another individual like that. Extremely organized, extremely well read. Um, everything we did, there, there, there was a purpose, there was a why. And, you know, I remember during my time at UW, we were 0-2 against Oregon. And then I got to Oregon after my two years at Washington, and it was just all go 24-7, less about the details, more about the relationships, more about the grind, and more about the bottom line. And that was it. And guess what? Oregon, you know, during Mario Cristobal's time there, he never lost to he never lost to Washington, you know. And I think that's important to remember. There, there, but there is a balance uh, in terms of being able to create long term uh, success and sustainability within your organization, and not have to deal with a high level of turnover uh, where mid level employees are getting burned out because they're not getting paid X amount of money or not getting compensated the right way. Um, and I think that's important to remember. And, and to me, it's like there's this balance of both um, having a situational awareness of uh, the culture that needs to be fed within your organization and then being able to keep the main thing, the main thing. And the main thing always is talent acquisition. That's it. At the end of the day, you have to have the players out there um, that can put you in a situation to be successful ultimately on the football field. So. Um, you know, it, it, best case scenario, you have a guy that has a really good understanding and a really good grip on everything uh, that involves college football, but also understands the urgency that recruiting needs to be attacked with. There's no doubt about it. You, you, you have to get the players, especially to win at, at the very highest level. You know, I, I'm I'm really kind of big on, on, on the sliding scale, right? What What's your goal? Are, if you're trying to win a national title, Go get me the freakiest of the freaks and fit what you do to that talent you can sign. I think if your goal is to be more of a bowl team or a competitive team, you're, if you're if you're Kansas State, right, you're not going to win a national title at Kansas State. Apologies if we have any Kansas State fans listening to this. I think y'all are a super passionate fan base and, and love y'all. 
But, you know, I, I was going through some of the PFF list and uh, Kansas State has done a really good job picking over some of the three stars who can fit their system, right? I think it's a mistake to just try to go get a hodgepodge of max talent if you're one of those sort of mid-tier type programs. Like, let's say like a not, not a top 30 program in, in Power 5, right? So, fi- like, understanding what the goal, the potential, the ceiling, and the resources are and also the expectations, clearly. Uh, hopefully, those expectations match those resources. And then having a good strategy to go out and do that. That's not to say you don't want talent, but the OKG strategy, our kind of guys, is much more viable, I think, because there's more ways to skin a cat at that mid-level. At the very highest level, there's really just one way. It's have the guys that were out there at, at Future 50 or you know <laughs> all, all America Bowl and be like, wait a second that much weight should not move that fast. Like that's literally the, that's the formula. It, it's, I guess we're giving away secrets here. Um, you know, so that, I, I think that's, that's interesting. What, what specifically as far as positions that Napier has hired at Florida, do you think might be sort of game changing or, or be something that people model? Cause like we, we make fun of the whole, or at least we did on cover three, that the game changer coordinator title, which is just special teams coordinator. I mean, you can, you can call it what you want, but what is he doing behind the scenes that you like a lot? Yeah, I think we've we've started to see this around the country more. So I listen, I want to give credit to Florida, but I also know that there are a lot of other programs doing this. And I think that's what we've talked about earlier. I think there's going to be this embrace uh, of a two pronged system on the evaluation side, um, splitting up those departments between high school and college. Uh, So they right now, what they have is somebody overseeing the high school side of the evaluation process, somebody overseeing. Uh, the collegiate side of the evaluation process and it's not just two people um you know but a, a full-time staff and a full-time player personnel department um and and what i think is and what i've always thought and, and being in one of these roles is you want to give the head coach a mouthpiece uh in every single bucket of your organization so if it's player personnel if it's on-campus recruiting uh if it's analytics roster management um if it's player retentions, alumni affair, NIL, there has to be somebody. That's where we are in terms of collegiate athletics, especially in college football. There has to be somebody to oversee all those intricacies of of, of that department and, and that organization off the field. And there's a lot. And I think he spearheaded that. Uh, and I think in return, what that does, it takes so much off of the responsibility of the head coach end of your full-time 10 assistants. Uh, And I think at the end of the day, um, that's what you want. You want to put your your head coach and your assistant coaching staff in the best position to succeed. And how do you do that? It's by letting them do uh, their job. And what is their job? Having that clearly defined and what their roles are. So not only the the talent acquisition side of it, uh, but the player development side of it as well. So I think they've done a phenomenal job. I I don't know if, you know, it seems like, they've hired um so many people it's hard for me to 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 keep up with you know like the first wave was like oh okay great like awesome look at florida expanding the second wave was like oh that's interesting i haven't seen that title the third wave is like hey i don't know if they if they they actually had a vision for this guy or they just had the money to go hire him you know what i'm saying so um it would be interesting to see how that plays out but for florida in particular like I said, the only thing that matters is if you're going to have seven and a half million dollars in support staff salary pool, that has to correlate and that has to correlate quickly. And it's like you said, like they're in the arena with Georgia and Alabama, so they yeah. know what it looks like. So this OKG philosophy in terms of us being card counters and maybe we're seeing something different that nobody else is is seeing. It's like, yeah, OK, maybe two or three of those guys in your class Maybe you identify as guys that that are, are something that you can develop that nobody else saw. The rest is you have a microscope on you and everybody knows what you need to win. And you can't bring a spoon to a gunfight. That's just not the way it works. So, um, you know, that's who they're in competition with. Georgia, they're the new national champ. They're on their side of the conference. You know, that's what Billy Napier is going to have to deal with is, is Kirby Smart. And, you know, for him, he's been there. He's worked with Kirby Smart. He knows what it looks like. So, um Kudos to him for getting the things that he needs that he feels that they have to do to be successful at a, at a championship level. 
for sure. Um, and you know, I, I, I ran into some guys at, at the, at the convention and you, you mentioned the frustration about all, all the changing rules and landscape of the sport. What, one thing and mentioned having, having an NIL coordinator, right. And this is not UF specific, but different States have different laws, uh, because the NCAA didn't come up with something as a, a the schools, I mean, we say the NCAA, but the NCAA is the schools who vote on this kind of stuff because they didn't come up with an actual like, legislative process for NIL. Uh, and they punted it to Congress and Congress is like, eh, we, we, we got bigger stuff. We're, we're not, not messing with this right now. Um, all the states passed different laws. And in some states, Florida being one of them, uh, they're much more restrictive. Now, they're working to change this law and we'll probably get it changed in this legislative session after seeing the, the impact of it in one year. But if you're a coach at a school in Florida, or there's a lot of other states like this, I believe Nevada uh, is also one, you're not allowed to actually discuss, like, I, I can't go to a business and say, you know what, I think, like, a, I'm, this player would be a good fit for your business, right? You can't even talk about, like, how to get NIL deals for some of your guys. Or if you're a support person, you're not supposed to. And that actually, I will say, matters. I, I was talking with a coach in a state where you are allowed somewhat to, to do this. And he was like, look, the thing is not every kid wants NIL immediately. And some families are going to take offense. If you just start, like if you have your, your boosters or whoever's running NIL, just go rogue. You'd be like, Hey, NIL, NIL, NIL re recruiting wise. Right? Like now some kids, it's very clear. Hey, we're gonna have to give the dad a job under the table. We're gonna have to move the family and, and we're going to have to give them, you know, 50 K a year. Okay. Like, start on that right now. Other kids, they don't want that right then. And some families might take offense to that. So that's just kind of another example. If you have an NIL coordinator, maybe that person can be working with the coaching staffs. Hey, we've had this kid on a visit for a junior day. Now what, what's our read on the family? How are we going to get this player? What's our marketing plan for him? Having all that staff is absolutely can be, if you can coordinate it, right. If you have the right type of CEO, which I guess we'll see if Napier can be, he certainly was very picky. Uh, about the jobs he took. He, he turned down Auburn, most notably in the last hiring cycle, probably because they had a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes there that maybe you wouldn't want to work for uh, at the time. I, if Napier can be a good CEO and can manage all this new staff effectively, there's no real reason that they can't compete with the Georgia or Alabama. We've seen it under Spurrier, and we've also seen it under Urban Meyer. Like Florida fans and boosters, they know what it looks like when Florida is running well, as you said. And they also know what it looks like when it's when it's not, or, or when it's fakery, like winning the East under McIlwain when the East was kind of down. And then you would go face a legitimate playoff team like Alabama and get smoked. Um, right. Yeah. We got a lot of mileage out of this topic, man. This has been good. Yeah, we did. I mean, it, it, and it is something that I think it's, like I said, I think Florida and what Billy Napier's done there in a short amount of time in terms of being able to expand his staff like I said, I think a lot of teams and, and administrations throughout the country are looking at them and maybe not going to be able, certainly not going to be able to scale up to seven and a half million dollars in, in support staff salary pool, um, but are looking at aspects of what they're doing. And I think Florida, Georgia, Alabama, you look at Ohio State, obviously they, they have a proven recipe as well. Um, but these schools serve really as the example to the rest of college football. And as they move, the rest of college football follows. So um, it's going to be interesting to see kind of what the ripple effects uh, of everything that they're doing, uh, the cause and effect of that for everybody else. For sure. All right. So we have a couple minutes left here. We're not going to give away everybody who is, you know, going to be a five-star in our 24 seven sports five-star reveal show, which is tomorrow on the 24 seven sports YouTube page at what time? Uh, 10 30 i believe uh central time all right so central time uh which is <laughs> eastern <laughs> time 11 30 for uh so we'll be revealing yeah. all of our 24 7 sports five stars coop a, a couple questions for you here uh, i'm in these meetings but i just kind of want you to articulate it how many guys do you think legitimately could have been number one this year that's a great question um I think when you when you kind of look at it, probably I would say three. Um, and I would start with, and I don't think I'm giving anything away here, but you know, uh, Travis Hunter certainly at at, at the top, um, and has uh, time and time again, not only throughout his senior season, but with the exposure that our teams had uh, with him, 
really kind of vindicated his spot atop uh, of the top 247. You look at Walter Nolan, I think he's just rare uh, in terms of his size uh, and his multiplicity and what he can do and where he can play. And then the third uh, is Drew Aller, um, you know, which is certainly a guy that, you know, I, I think his combination of size uh, and his physical tools with his arm strength. And then I think something that is is really um, maybe overlooked in his game is his mobility and his his ability to make throws off schedule, play off platform in and outside of the pocket. But you look at those three and I think Aller has a little bit more ways to go in terms of his development. It's just one of those guys. I think you look back. I remember studying Josh Allen in college, and it was one of those guys I just could not wrap my head around. You know, here was very similar um, in, in terms of stature, but the the arm talent and the arm strength was undeniable. But there were some really legitimate concerns uh, about the accuracy. Um, and I remember, and I just could not. I I couldn't get over it. I just did not see that translating. I didn't think that was something you could really correct. Um, Shoot, I think he's turned out to be, what, 68, 69% passer over the last two seasons. So, um, yeah, top five, top six in that category in the NFL. So um, that example of a guy like Josh Allen, I think, has maybe propped up a guy like Drew Aller, um, where I, I think the coaching and the development aspect um, for his trajectory is going to be really critical uh, to where he ends up. But I mean, the, the position value, what he can do. Um, it's certainly one of those guys. I would not be surprised if we're back here three, four years now. And this is the sole guy that we're talking about, uh, being drafted number one in the NFL draft. Have you, I assume you saw the Josh Allen throw on, on Sunday night. Um, mm -hmm. Have you seen the Twitter? Uh, it's like a four-picture graphic. It, it it shows the play, and it's essentially you know two verts with with, with that that kind of deep over route, and it's like here's what a bad quarterback throws, and it says you know the, the 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 vert on the left side of the screen to the guy who's doubled. Here's what a good quarterback throws: the the deep over, which is wide open, right? And then here's what an alien throws, and Josh Allen throws the ball over cover two, which just isn't the thing that people. Do it, it was like the first time Barry Bonds hit the ball, and remember it hit the sailboat, and people were like, "Oh, right. you can hit you can hit the ball into the bay in San Francisco." That's that's different. I mean, granted, he was roided like crazy, but you know, uh, just kind of had him on the mind with the Hall of Fame boat today. That right. those special abilities, just arm strength wise. But you're right, like Josh Allen in in, in college was he was a very much like a tools versus stats guy because it was like, why the hell is his, his completion percentage? This bad. And honestly, the first year in Buffalo, they weren't entirely sure what to do with him. And then Brian Dayball, to his credit, really was like, you know what? We're going to go like all RPO, max protect deep shots, and let this guy create. And ever since then, like they're not asking him to be all West Coasty. And I, I think increasingly, that's a good example, right, of what we were talking about. If you want to compete at that very highest level, go get the freaks and fit what you do to their freakish talents. Don't try to pigeonhole that right. guy into something. If you put Josh Allen in one of these very classically West Coast systems, he, I'll say it look like crap. That, that's probably exaggeration, but he would not look as good as he looks now. Like they really have said, we're only going to do things you do well. Right. And, and don't overthink it. I think if there's one thing that I've learned in the evaluation process outside of what you, you learn and um, being able to uh, get a good feel for somebody's personality and character, obviously that plays into it as well. But in terms of the physical traits, do not overthink it. And I think with Drew Aller, what we have continued to come back to, he is one of one in that category, really from a, from a physical standpoint. Um, there's just nobody else in the class that can do what he can do. Is he a finished product? No, not by any stretch of the imagination. Is he, is he going to be a guy that's going to come in and, and contribute early at Penn State in his first year? Probably not. But the potential and the athletic upside there is something that no other prospect in the class at his position possesses, which also happens to be the most important position on the field. Um, and I remember thinking about this about Josh Allen. I remember thinking about this about Lamar Jackson. We're so focused on what they can't do. We don't give them credit on what they can do. Um, and I think that kind of takes away from the player. And, um, you know, he's certainly a guy when, when you watch him, it just the the film pops. You're like, okay, that's that's different, right? Like you, like the example that you said 
uh, about Josh Allen. He's got some stuff to him um, that really nobody else in the class has at his position. So it's interesting you, you bring up Lamar, right? Um, because there's two things here. Number one, I stood next to Jimbo at FSU's camp. Like they were always very open about who could, you could stand wherever you wanted to basically on the field and, and watch prospects. He dirted balls all over the place. Like he just, I was like, this is really in, the, in that setting, just really pretty raw and like just not close to accurate. Um, and you can go back and look at the camp reports, right? It was like, hey, this is, there are a decent number of guys there in a year that wasn't that great of a quarterback year who were better in that setting. Um, it was just like, this is just so off from being accurate. And then he goes out and has a nice senior year. What? But I think it's a great example, too, of fit what you do to the freaky talents. Petrino, for all the bad stuff, and certainly not one of the good guys in college football, uh, based on like all reports, it seems. He was with the Falcons. He ends up not working out there. Obviously, the Vic stuff happens. But if you listen to the interviews with him talking about Vic and Lamar, he's like, I knew that if I ever got another Lamar type guy or another Vic type guy, I would totally change what I run to take advantage of his talents more. And in Lamar, he got that guy. And I, I, I think that's a great example, right? What Petrino ran before was like, go look at all the other Petrino stuff that he did before he got Lamar. They weren't running heavy zone read stuff. They weren't running some of this in, in, inverted veer and, and all, all, all the RPO concepts off it. He totally changed what they what he did to take advantage of a special player. And the coaches who can do that, I think, increasingly are are going to have success, especially if you want to if you want to level up. Who do you have? I mean, he had, uh, I think, Tyler Wilson, right? Uh, yeah. Um, Ryan a couple Mallett, stash, those type yeah. of guys. Not really going to run yeah. those guys. But that's who he recruited right. to his system previously. But credit to him, and I think credit to the Baltimore Ravens for embracing Lamar Jackson and what his skill set was. I think that's such the issue. And I'm, trust me, I'm not going to throw stones in a glass house. That's when I when I go back to Lamar Jackson and, and and think about the evaluation process that I went through with him myself. Same with Josh Allen is I was completely wrong on what my mindset was. It was more of like, OK, does this guy fit? to the current landscape of his position in the NFL. Not really noticing or understanding that what they provide is different than any other quarterback provides in the NFL. Josh Allen with his mobility and his arm talent and what he can do on the perimeter. Lamar Jackson uh, as well with his with his ability with his legs. So um, I think those type of like fluid, open-minded um, type of coaches uh, and evaluators are, are so critical to the growth and development um, of the game. Um, it was neat to see those guys go out and, and see what they've, they've turned into, um, you know, two of the best players in all of the NFL, regardless of position. For sure. Uh, all right. Next question for you with the ranking show, we're not going to give away, you know, obviously, because you guys need to watch that tomorrow, 1130 central 10 or 1130 Eastern 10 central on the 24 seven sports YouTube page which you should like and subscribe as well. Like and subscribe, cover three if you guys can. Really appreciate it. And by the way, if you're a Spotify listener, uh, if you're an Android user maybe, you can now give us five-star ratings on Spotify. We'd really appreciate that. Uh, Spotify finally opened up ratings and they want to be a serious player in the podcast game. So please do make sure to give us those ratings on Spotify. I went and did it on my wife's phone yesterday. So uh, please go ahead and, and do that. Um, we always have 32 five-stars, right? But we do that because there's 32 first round picks in the NFL. It's 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 kind of a standardization measure. We could argue back and forth if that's the right way to do things. That's how we did it before I got the company, and obviously that's just kind of the way the way it is. Uh, but not every year is created equal. What wh where were some of the the cutoff points for you in this process? Like, did you get to 18 and say, okay, these guys are no doubt five stars. Like, there's no question about it. And in the next 20 are potentially five stars we, we, we have, like where was sort of like the the no doubt range and then the i could see how this guy could be a five star i could argue against it for you yeah i think self-consciously I'm, I'm very aware of the fact that i think I, I take a tremendous amount of pride in the evaluation process and um 
you know, I'm very thorough in that aspect. And what I mean by that is I think there's, there's a higher level and a higher degree of being able to really check all those boxes for, for me personally. I think you look at one through 10 in this class and it's a combination of checking boxes. And what I mean by that is not only having the prototypical weight for their position um, and checking the boxes in terms of height, weight, speed, uh, verified measurables, uh, multi-sport data, track and field data. Uh, but these were guys to go along with exceptional physical traits at each of their positions, had the production to back it up. Um, so I think one through 10, when you start looking at those guys, you get a really good feel for what we like to call clean players. Um, and, you know, certainly guys that you're going to feel really good about projecting uh, at the next level and not only having success, but um, immediate success at the next level. I think 11 um, really threw about, 21, 22 is, is a fluctuating range of players that have the ability um, to be a top 10 level talent, but there's something in their game that is restricting them to that point. Uh, and really my favorite range is probably 22 through 32. Um, and I think that's projecting a lot of the players that for whatever reason uh, have flashed those capabilities uh, of being a high level caliber player at the next level, but haven't done it consistently. And I think it's trying to dig a little bit deeper, find out the why, figure out why they haven't had consistent success, and then look at their situation and see, hey, is that something at the next level where you think that's a good fit? Uh, and, and is that going to be a place where they can go and have success? So as you said, it all comes back to Sunday uh, with the top 32. And I think that's important. As you can see, I think one through 100 and uh, Two four seven, um, all those guys that we have ranked, our philosophy, we want it to be consistent throughout. Um, and the NFL is a height, weight, speed game. That's how we wanted to make our rankings and we wanted to shape it towards that. So um, that's a big part. I'm really proud of, of the job that we've done and uh, super excited for tomorrow. Uh, one one uh, question we got here, and, and my thought is like, if if the people who are so dedicated to this are asking us questions like this, we should probably go ahead and clarify for them. And, and Robert asks, uh, do the five stars get broken up regionally, like five from Cali, Texas, and Florida, or is it just the best players? Yeah, simply put, it's it's the best players. Um, you know, I, I I do think it's interesting to go back. I think you, you try to keep the most objective wins as possible look at the top 32, how you got there, go back over that process, vet it, ask questions. Um, obviously, you're going to have a lot of people involved and, and, and not just us and Gabe, Chris and myself, but but Steve and the regional team and yourself, bud. So there's a lot of information flying around. So I think there's a lot of checks and balances. But for us, at the end of the day, our job is to put the best 32 players uh, and, and really stamp them as five stars. Uh, and then not only get them in the right neighborhood, but get them aligned one through 32. I will say, I, I thought this year, A, because we, 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 we've staffed up, right? We, we, we have you, we have, we have Chris, we have, we have Gabe, obviously, you know, very dedicated to watching the film. Uh, but this year, the evaluation process was, I think, easier than it's been. Like last year, there we had so many camps and combines canceled. So you were sort of, to make it like a pilot reference, you're, you're kind of just flying by you didn't really have all, all those measurables, right? And that is so important. We, we, we see these teams staffing up data-wise and, and bringing on more and more you know, database guys and, and, and guys who, who can run the numbers and find the trends of, of different combinations of athleticism and size and birth date and hand size and neck size, hat size, <laughs> you, know, you, you name it, that, that, tr that trends to a future NFL player. Um, this year, getting that, that data back, actually having real camps over the summer, I think was, was beneficial. It, it also, it's beneficial to eyeball guys in person. Like you can watch them on, 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 on a highlight tape. You can find their huddle and go look at them in, in, in game. Right. And we were talking about a guy in the group chat the other day who I remember Ivan's, I think it was, who watched him a couple cycles ago. It was like, this is the laziest, worst looking non highlight clips I've ever seen. And the guy's already in the transfer portal and had to transfer down a level. Like he went to a G five school, but Seeing guys in person, I think like the 3D thing that you see, right? Like how is this guy's body actually built is very helpful. Uh, certainly. I mean, I think, you know, you, you think about the experience and it was new for me because of NCAA rules outside of 
prospects being able to come to campus and work work out for you over the summer, you didn't really get to see these guys a lot other than their unofficial and official visits. And, and then even then, you're not seeing them move around. So to be able to go down to San Antonio, get their get their height, get their weight, get their hand size and, and their arm uh, length and so on and so forth, and then seeing just the way that they interact, um, I think that's that's a, a subconscious part of the evaluation process, yeah. not, not only with yourself as an individual, but how they interact with their teammates. How do they transition uh, from drill to drill uh, in their practices? Where Where is it that you see them go? Yeah, maybe they're asleep during an individual, but on one-on-ones, you see they tap into something different in terms of a, a competitive nature. So it's all those type of things that those are really kind of, the, they're all supplemental data points, right? Your, your baseline is the tape. You're always going to refer back to the tape. Um, and then everything in terms of physical traits, testing measurements, uh, so on and so forth, live exposure um, is all part of the, this, this big piece of the puzzle uh, that you're trying to figure out with, with these players. Um, so it's certainly, it's an intriguing aspect. And I think you have to, you, like the frame of reference that you have to keep is, it's not a science. It, and it, and it, it's, it's more of an art form, you know, like I wrote that in the article, like, this is something you got to go back and it takes a a lot of uh, time to go back and understand through years and years of the evaluation process. Why did I miss? And it's more important to, to, to understand why you had success uh, at certain aspects as well. So I think the reevaluation process, reexamining maybe some of the reasons or or details you thought you might've missed or some of the details uh, that you correctly valued in the process are, are really important. And listen, there's a lot of guys in the top 32. All of them are there for a reason. Not all of them are going to hit. That's just the nature of the beast for, for one, for one reason or the other. Um, we all think they have five-star caliber potential in terms of their athleticism and where they project. Um, but not all of those guys are going to be successful. And, and, and a lot of them are going to have stories, like you said, but um, of, of maybe not being able to hack it at the P5 level and have to transfer somewhere else. So, um, that's just part of the process. I think for us, it's, it's going back, looking back and, and being studious and asking the right questions, why we try to refine our process and, and make it the best possible. For sure. And really, I mean, the thing is you don't want to just totally flip your process over. I, I know I kind of have a matrix that, that I've, I've sent to you as far as historically first round types that the rankings have missed on. I mean, can, can we put these guys into certain buckets that are identifiable at the time, like not second guessing hindsight buckets, but Hey, like if the guy checks these couple of boxes here, we really need to re-examine what we have on him because there may be some hidden upside or, I mean, there are certain buckets. Like I'll go ahead and share one because it's not going to be an industry secret. If you gain more than 25% of your, of your draft body weight post high school and you keep your same speed, meaning you don't have to change positions. Guess what? We probably are going to miss on you because that means that, that that's not, projectable strength coaches would love to tell you it is but for every one that they're actually able to put you know going from 200 to 250 there's five or six guys who they're they're going to call hard gainers who are not able to put on that kind of weight and keep that level of speed but routinely that's a type of player that we miss on because we would probably be fired uh or should be fired if we're routinely projecting guys to to gain 25 percent or more of their draft weight post high school, right? A normal amount right. is more in that kind of 10 to 15% range. We get the outliers when they add an extra 10% on, but keep their, their speed or agility. Right. And I think inversely too, on the, the overset size of it too, you know, with offense and defensive linemen. And I think that really truly depends on, on the programs uh, and the structure that they're going to be provided at the next level. And we have a couple cases of that throughout the class in the top two, four, seven, and there's different philosophies on that uh, in terms of different levels of conviction that each of us have as individuals, whether or not those people can, and those players can be successful at the next level, uh, depending on whether, you know, weight dependent, right? Uh, and there's a really couple good examples throughout the top two, four, seven, you'll see guys where it's like, it's a big question mark. Hey, can this guy put on 15 to 20 pounds at the next level? And is he going to be able to anchor or is this guy going to be able to shed 
right. 30, 40 pounds and, and, and be able to maintain his weight and his athleticism and weight's not going to be an issue for him. So um, that's a huge unknown. I think the, like, yeah. And I think the how one much thing faster is, will you get you if you drop do. the weight? Yeah, but at at the same time, I, I guess I'm talking more in in the line of scrimmage, right? Right. That's um, what I'm saying. Like like if so, Evan Neal, right? I have a right. photo of Evan Neal weighing in at 374 from the Nike opening in Miami uh, before his senior year. He couldn't play at 374, right? I mean, like not at the college level. But how do you project how much more athletic a guy, a big guy, is going to get if he drops down to the range we think he should be? Some of these guys are going to un- unlock athleticism, and some might not. Right? Like, like, right. It's tough to do. I mean, I think there's flashes of that you look at you look at Evan Neal, and I think it's a combination of the of the scheme as well. You look at Alabama and what they're doing. I mean, the ball is out so quickly out of Bryce yeah. Young's hand as well. You know, so like when I looked at Evan Neal coming out of high school in IMG, I thought, wow, that here is going to be what you're looking for at the right tackle position. I did not think he was going to anchor Alabama's offensive line for the next three to four years at the left tackle position. But a lot of that, we look at some of these guys, Keontae Goodwin, Tegra Shabola, Elijah Pritchard. And the one thing that I think you have to to consider and take into this too is the width of the player. Sure. And especially a Goodwin and Shabola, you look at both of those guys and their athletic traits – yeah, maybe they're not exceptional athletes, but they're good athletes who understand how to use their body type and their leverage and their length to their advantage uh, in a pass set. And that's what I think uh, is really important. And the, and the other thing, too, is, you know, so much of this, especially on the, on the weight projection, comes down to what's between the ears and what's in the heart. I mean, that's that's really what it comes down to and whether these guys are going to be able to follow a consistent regimen over the next three to four to five years uh, to do what they need to do to maintain their ability to stay on the field. And that is not an easy thing to do if you ask athletes, whether it's putting on weight or keeping weight off. Um, so that has a lot, to, that has a lot to do with it as well. That's also where getting the prospect on campus, right? Seeing what his background is like, I mean, socioeconomic factors at home are an important part of an evaluation, right? Or does he come from a household that maybe, can't afford like quality food you know is 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 he living on junk food from you know from from the convenience store and how will his body shape uh transform or like is he in a household where he should probably have the resources to make better food choices and is not making those is that something that is more ingrained is going to be more difficult for you to deal with as a staff and we, we we talk about kids on the opposite end of that spectrum some very you know some of the poorest areas in the country down, down in the glades down here in florida and i've had coaches tell me oh we can put 40 pounds on that kid and that's a bit of hyperbole but not always and they are trying to use that knowledge that they gain from having a kid on campus on a junior day and coming back up for the for the spring game and and you're not just looking at the kid you're talking to the parents and you're saying okay like what you know what do you do for work you're trying to get a feel for for the the family background like that is absolutely a factor we don't really talk about that a whole lot but I guarantee you these coaches are looking at that. Yeah, it's a huge part of the process. You know, it's a huge part of the process that is more invested in at the next level with, you would think, a billion-dollar entity in the NFL than it is at the collegiate level. Um, and I think when you, when you start talking about probably the former model of college football, not in today's age with the transfer portal where there's, um, you know, a number of reasons why why players uh tend to transfer nowadays but um i mean you you start to think about it and it's uh i don't know it's 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 fascinating um i'm sorry but i lost my train of thought on what i was even talking about but what we're talking about uh, the the family the family backgrounds and 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 the the old model of college football versus the new yeah i'm sorry so the the wiring aspect of it um is, is really what it comes down to so you know, wiring, academics, character, all these type of things. What is their competitive nature? The stuff that we talked about when, when seeing these guys in, in San Antonio. And, and, and it's all the little things that measure up after multiple exposure points in the process from, from the time they were a sophomore to the time they were a senior to the time they're getting ready to enroll in your university. I think that's really important. Um, and it's a, it's a collection of data points, but I, I do think is – that is where you're going to find the biggest indicator of whether or not truly a player is going to be successful at the next level. 
um, is putting the, those pieces to the puzzle together and saying, OK, does this player come from a structure um, to where it's important to have your house in order? And how is that going to translate once he's incorporated into our culture? I think that's a million dollar question. And I think the misses in our industry and the evaluation process, that's where they come from. That's the genesis of it. It's not because a guy wasn't big enough, fast enough, strong enough. It was because they didn't have the want to or there was something else externally that was affecting them, uh, prohibiting them from being successful. And that, that again, the thing you talked about, that that is that is really pretty crucial. And you mentioned the word culture, right, Coop? And you are going to take some guys who you're questionable on whether they can work. But you can't take too many of them. You have to hope that the balance of your culture is good enough to where, like Clemson calls them knuckleheads, right? Can't, we only want to take a couple, but we're willing to take a chance on a couple because of special ability. And we think we can get them to sort of assimilate to our culture that we've we've established here uh, to you know do the right things and largely stay out of trouble and 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 work at the level that you need to do to in order to be a championship ball club um no that you're you're exactly right i didn't uh, by the way the comments i didn't realize that uh that Giannis put on 50 pounds of muscle uh from the time he was in high I mean, school he's or, he's different but yeah that's, that's a great example i mean yeah. he um i mean coming from from greece you know in terms of what he was afforded and the resources that he has to to be able to invest in his body in the in nba just not even comparable from where he was to to where he is now for sure awesome i actually have some cool stuff to send you uh, i was doing a little deep dive on some of the draft stuff this morning which i don't want to give away on the show quite yet but uh coot man we went went 75 minutes that's that's what i was gonna say that was a long one it was man sorry <laughs> about that well uh goodness no it was my slack good. is blowing up it, am i missing meetings here what am i missing let's see um yeah, nothing huge looks like cool all right. Uh, well, I will get this uploaded. Really appreciate everybody. Give, make sure you give the video a thumbs up, like, and subscribe. See Coop tomorrow, 1130 Eastern, 1030 Central on the 24-7 Sports YouTube channel for our 24-7 Sports five-star reveal show where he will absolutely nerd out and just give you the integrity on all <laughs> of these prospects. And I don't uh, get to do that, though. You know, like I feel like I never get to do that, and I feel like I'm super excited tomorrow to just talk about these dudes and what they offer. You know, I mean, you know who the audience like the, if you are watching a recruiting show where Coop is going to go down the top 32 kids <laughs> at 11 30 Eastern on a Wednesday and you're spending your lunch break with them, like which we really appreciate y'all do with us. Just dude, embrace the diehard nature. Like that's, who's going to watch Admit that show. It. Casuals are not it. watching that show. Coop's cronies is what we call them. I like that. I got Bud's Brigade, Coop's, Coop's Cronies. This is Bud's this is, Brigade. I haven't heard that one. That's, that's from the uh, from from the Locks Pod, the, the 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 betting show we do on Cover Three. So there you go. Perfect. Awesome. All right, guys. Uh, I'll see you next time.